Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the sixth event of the leadership program 2024. The program is open to all students who wish to think about what they are doing, what they will do in the future, and the challenges ahead. I'm Paolo Carta, Professor of Leadership and Governance and Political Theory. I also serve as a Dean of the School of Law. As you all, I eagerly await today's event, and I'm honored and delighted to introduce our guest. But before that, I would like to thank my friend Andrea Nardelli, the General Manager of uh, Aquila Basket, who shared the organization with the School of Law and made this event possible. And I would like to extend my thanks to the Aquila Basket team represented here by some of its amazing players, Derek Cook and Matt Money. And thank you for being here. And uh, I should say that in September, 2020, I read an article in the New York Times uh, about David Hollander's course at New York University, How Basketball Can Save the World. That was the title of the class. And at the time, I was preparing the syllabus for my upcoming, uh, upcoming course, uh, Leadership and Governance, and the statements mentioned in that article were enlightening. One day in 2023, I received an email message from my friend Fulvio Cortez, a colleague, a colleague here at the School of Law, informing me that he was reading a splendid book entitled Our Basketball save the word. Furthermore, he said the author was a great and uh, legally trained professor. The 13 uh, guiding principles contained in that book, in this book, are now my guiding principles. I use them in class with my students all the time. And when I met Andrea Nardelli, who shares the Hollander's philosophy, we immediately said, let's invite him. Who knows? And David said yes. And I'm so glad he accepted to be with us today. David Hollander certainly does not need my introduction. He is Assistant Dean of Real World and Clinical Professor with the Preston Robert Tisch Institute for Global Sport at New York University. One of NYU's most popular professors, David is the recipient of new NYU highest faculty honor 2019 NYU Distinguished Teaching Award. He's also being recognized with the highest NYU School of Professional Studies honors. His signatory innovative experiential program, Real World, is one of the oldest program at NYU. According to various media, Real World is the future of higher education. His course, How Basketball Can Save the World, has received worldwide media coverage, including CBS News, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. An international movement began when Penguin Random Biles published uh, the book, How Basketball Can Save the World, translated into Italian by Mondadori. David Hollander frequently comments in top tier media, including the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, USA Today, uh, ABC News, CNN, Bloomberg, and NPR. A passionate, as a passionate educator, he provides intellectual, cultural, and social programming for New York University students. Before thanking um, David, I would like to show you um, a video. If I walk my basketball court, I'll start to hear basketball sounds, to watch people play, to lose myself in good time. My name is David Hollander. I'm an assistant dean of a program in my new career. I teach a very popular course called My Basketball Can Save the World. The fast break is the ultimate expression of a human being living through a changing world. When trying to figure out what you have to do in order to meet the needs of the changing facts and circumstances that you develop in front of you, with other people. I wish I could teach that in a leadership course. I wish I could teach that in a corporate culture course. You like other sports? Basketball is a small space. It's intimate. 
it forces us to see each other. That is sports in space. Baseball, a person may not even touch each other the entire game. Everybody can touch the ball. Everybody can do anything with the ball. There's never been an anti hierarchical structure intentionally created. So, you have to have space. Okay. You can strangers. But take strangers. I think this is a good thing. It was a And the onset of the pandemic, what did the world? People would not stop playing one thing, and that was basketball. It was a global issue. But if they didn't take down the rooms, people would not stop going to that intimate space. And I need that space. If I see somebody, anybody, while well, I was in that space school, I can be when I was in that in the gallery. I looked at them and looked at them. And so, what does it mean that we don't want to each other? It's a grand, it's a silver, it's like a drum circle, except it's basketball. And for me, it's bad. So, you know, big round of applause for David Alamo. Okay, can you hear us? It sounds on okay, you can hear back there? Good. Um, thank you, Paula, for the uh, super kind introduction and for sending that email in the summer uh, after speaking with my new great friend, Andrea Nardelli, um, Aquila Basket. Uh, these are two really big thinking people um, who brought me to this beautiful place, Trento. Um, it's so nice to be here, to be in this law school, uh, the mountains, uh, it's like heaven. Um, and so let me just tell you a story, speaking of heaven, uh, about one of the last times I was in Italy. Um, next slide. So I don't know if you know the story of the saint of basketball. Um, do you know that story? Yeah, no. Um, I'm going to tell you how this happened. Uh, I was reading the New York Times uh, around Christmas time, 2021, and I read about a village in central Italy called Peretta Terme. Uh, and in Peretta Terme, they have a, a, a shrine, a, a church. The church has been around since the 15th century. And in that church, there's a shrine to basketball, a shrine to basketball. And people come from all over the country to play at this shrine for a better season, a better jump shot, uh, healed meniscus, you know, things like this. And I read that the village was frustrated. They're frustrated because they had made petition to the Vatican to have their local Madonna uh, a likeness of Mary that's on a bridge that connects the bridge to the village, also old bridge, 15th century. They wanted their local Madonna to be recognized as the first ever saint of basketball. And they were not hearing back. They were frustrated. So I read this article and I'm like, oh my God, this is me, this is my course. And I call my, my former student who's Italian from, from Italy, but he's working at NBC Sports in New York. And I'm like, Alessandro, can you believe this? He's like, I know, it's amazing. I'm like, I know. He's like, I'm home in Bologna for Christmas, for the holidays. He's close to the church. He drives to the church. He grabs the priest. The priest ends up being the first guest in my first hour, first class, 2022, how basketball saved the world. And I'm like, Father, what are going to do? How can I help you? What, what? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, class, a class like this, 153 students. Maybe not like this. Uh, 153 students. And I'm like, no grade, no, you know, not serious thing, but just everybody send me one sentence. Why does basketball deserve its own saint? And they send me a sentence and I put it together in this big 
letter like you know like that like this big like document like because basketball knows their boundaries because basketball has no language because basketball is every you know uh, country and i send it to the pope i'm like let's see what happens right and i go back to teaching the class somehow la republica you know this paper right la republica got hold of the letter and they published the entire letter in La Repubblica, in full, uh, this big feature story saying how these students, uh, you know, at New York University, and, and this this is the first international gesture of support for this, you know, movement. It could make the difference. That article was March, twenty twenty two. On April twelfth, Good Friday, March twenty twenty two, the Pope recognized the first ever patron saint of basketball. Yeah. The Madonna del Ponte from Peretta Terme. And I want you to know that is the first sport, team sport, ever to get its own saint. And people told me that's a miracle, man. That's amazing. What you did is that I can't, but you know, how many times is that going to happen? Right? Next slide. So last year, I gave my class a different project. In my book, I wrote a United Nations resolution for a world basketball day. I said, this, you know, this is what we need. If basketball is a special global language, um, uh, I want every one of you, 145 students, something like that, to send your final presentation uh, to an ambassador to the United Nations. And well, they did. And the ambassador from the Philippines had coffee with me in June. They're like, okay, it's so enough. And I told him about this resolution that I thought it was exactly what we should do. That was June of 2024. On August 24th, oh wait, 2023, August 24th, 2023. That's me on the floor of the United Nations General Assembly where the Philippines, co-sponsored by Peru, Nicaragua, and Indonesia, co-signed by 77 countries, approved by consensus, established World Basketball Day, December 21st, for the rest of our lives. I want you to know that was the fastest resolution from conception to adoption ever in the history of the United Nations. I also want you to know that it is the first sport, well, there's one other sport, chess. <laughs> it's the first sport ever to get its own day on the international calendar. <laughs> That's... This is why I'm here. Why? Why would the Pope, he's got a lot of things to do. Why would the Pope choose basketball? Why would the United Nations, they're very busy. Why would the United Nations say, we'll stop, we'll vote and choose basketball? because I believe that the world is starving for a new language or for a common language. I know this language. I've been speaking this language since I was six years old. When my father uh, uh, surprised my mother and, and took Armani and, and, and dumped a bunch of concrete in our backyard and put a whole basket. And he said, this is what you guys are doing. And I started speaking that language with my brothers and sisters. I started speaking that language with my friends, with neighbors, with kids I didn't even know just coming to play with us. It's the language I spoke with old men in the park who would get off work. And I was like 12 years old, but they treat me like an equal. So I would learn to speak that language correctly. And if you know this thing, 
basketball, it's not a spoken language, exactly. It's the language of, of eye contact. It's the language of peripheral vision. It's the language of creating space, understanding space, sharing space. It's the way I walk on the street. It's the way I walk in, an, in, in, in the subway. It's the way I walk in an airport. And wherever I've gone in the world, and I've been a lot of places, I go look for that space where they speak that language. It's my sanctuary. It's the place I go where the rest of the world goes away. And I start to find balance. I feel peace. My relationships with other people gets right. The world makes sense. And the amazing thing is, is that when I talk to other people who go to that space, they feel the same thing. They go there for that thing. And around 20, 2015, 2016, there were big elections in the United States. And um, well, the world was starting to break down. Uh, irreconcilable divisions, failing institutions, no trust. And I thought to myself, could I make the world look more like basketball? that feeling that people get with each other when they go to that space. Could I give that feeling language? Next slide. <laughs> I'm so happy she's here. I couldn't do both at the same time, I couldn't. Um, this, this is what I came up with. I came up with these 13 principles. I said, I'm going to do something no one else has ever done in higher education. I'm going to treat basketball like a philosophy, like an academic discipline, like math, like history, like law, like something you can think about in order to solve 21st century problems. I'm going to tell them to you right now. You don't have to read the book. You ready? Here we go. The first five principles are how you play the game. In other words, how you behave as a person. The next six are the way you change the world, social impact. And the last two are how we get to tomorrow. The first one, you, you've known it since you were, you know, six years old, five years old, cooperation, right? That's what they tell you. But in basketball, it's a very specific thing. I can go to a basketball court and not know anybody. And immediately, we start to find ways of knowing each other. Immediately, continuously, fluidly. Because we're in a small space. Because we're starting to kind of do this thing where I'm like, okay, you, oh, right, oh, yeah, oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, right. Immediately, continuously. Only five people at the maximum. And when you do this kind of exercise, well, you hear the world, many people say, I'd like to cooperate with you, but I don't trust you. I'd like to stop our conflict, but I don't trust you. How can I cooperate if I don't trust You've got it backwards. First, you cooperate. Then you create trust. Here, pass the ball. Oh, pass back. Okay. I'm going to move now. I wonder if he's going to see me. Basketball is a great model for being in space with other people. And instead of seeing and other, you see a human being 
an individual. And that is the basis. It's what Martin Luther King called the, the inescapable web of our mutuality. That's right. It's exactly what basketball is. And when you have that cooperative exercise, when you create that intimate space where people are communicating immediately, continuously, fluidly, then you start to build a world. You start to think about how much of this is about me and how much of this is about everybody else. In basketball, that's a constant calculation. But the beautiful thing about a basketball society is that, yes, some people have different skills. Not everyone is equal ability, but everyone knows on a basketball team, in order to achieve what you need to achieve, everyone must be given equal dignity. Many people like to talk about Steph Curry. He's a great player, great skills. 30 points a game, you know, 15 seasons. His statistics are clear. He has a teammate, Draymond Green. His statistics, different every night. Hard to see what he's doing. They've won more championships together than any players in the NBA. I know that if you ask Steph Curry, he goes nowhere without Draymond Green. And if you ask Draymond Green, of course, they don't win those championships without Steph Curry. In a basketball society, it's not about equal balance. It's about balance as a value. And when you have balance as a value, you can see when there are things that are imbalanced. If there's too much wealth inequality, if there's not enough food here and too much too little there balance is a value in this game it, a game that opens itself up to all kinds of abilities it's not just the most powerful the strongest the fastest it's a game that demands control finesse accuracy both kinds of players can dominate a basketball game there's a guy named nikola jokic who famously says I don't run fast, I don't jump high, I just play basketball. What does he mean? He just plays basketball. It's a universe that includes all kinds of people who can be the stars. It's an enlightened human resource management philosophy. It's not just the loud, the handsome like Andrea, Sorry. or the, uh, the charismatic, it's, different kinds of abilities that can lead, that can make a difference. That's because in this game, anybody can do anything. There is no other sport where any, everybody plays every position if they want to. In this sport, anybody can score. Anybody can touch the ball. It's an amazing thing. Positionless. They love talking about positionless basketball. The game was meant to be positionless. He intentionally said, no matter what you do, you can invent dribbling, you can invent all kinds of things. The most important thing is that everyone gets to do everything. This mindset that I can play any position, that I can change, it's the mindset of the 21st century. It's the future of work. I know that our students, at least undergraduates who graduate, they will change their jobs three, four, five times, six times in their life. They may change entire fields three or four times. Some fields may become totally obsolete. What's the kind of mind that navigates the 21st century where so much change so fast technologically, legally, politically, it's a mind that understands how to run the fast break, where the only thing you are in the fast break is what you must be in order to do what you have to do in order to solve what you have to solve. With other people. The advanced level of this 
is that basketball players understand. But when they join the right kind of team, the right kind of team, it's not about team chemistry. Everybody in sports likes to talk about team chemistry. You know what team chemistry is? Team chemistry is he's like this, she's like that. And if you put them together, him like this, her like that, that'd be a good team. That'd be a good chemistry, a good combination. Basketball is about alchemy. It's about the total transformation of matter into something else. Team alchemy is he's like this, she's like that. You put them together and they both become something else something better because of the effect that they've had on each other, something totally different and thus better. Remember the pandemic? Good times? <laughs> Remember we were sitting at home and we were saying to ourselves, when this is over, things are gonna change. Right, we're gonna change everything, man. We're gonna like reform the economy, refund the defund, uh, you know, change the police. We're gonna change. We have to reimagine everything. How are you gonna reimagine everything? How are you gonna change the institutions when you're still the same? Alchemy demands that if if, if positionless says none of us are just one thing, alchemy says. We can no longer be who we were if we want the world to change. What did Gandhi say? Be the change you wish to see. That's what the best basketball teams do. People become something else because of each other. And that's what a society that wants to reimagine, reinvent. Uh, uh, we have to change. And then the institutions will change to serve us. And then the institutions will change and, and, and we will change in order to, and so it goes. Once you get to that level, once you alchemize as an individual, because of the effect that we are having on each other and the world is having on the rest of us, then you can do all the things that we like to talk about, all the fun things, change the world. Social impact. There's so many problems that only one world can solve. Climate, water, food, disease. This game, from the beginning, was global. This game, as soon as it was invented, the guy said, I'm sending a boat to Paris, Brazil, Australia, Tianjin, China. I'm going to put this all over the world. It wasn't just meant for one place. To make it global is the kind of thinking that a 21st century world has to have if we want to solve the kinds of problems that only a whole world can solve. A lot of people also don't know that basketball at its beginning was gender inclusive. This guy had invented this game. He was he was in Naismith. He was playing it at a place in Springfield, Massachusetts. And basically, uh, guys were playing pickup basketball. They were playing this game. And like two weeks into the invention of this game, there were women who were working at a grade school who would come eat their lunch and watch these men play. And after the game, was over, they came up to the inventor of the game, James Naismith, and they said, hey, could, uh, could we play? And he was like, yeah, why not? Why not? It's 1891. Women did not have equal rights. They did not have to vote. They did not have all kinds of, of, of respect as equal human beings. I don't know. If we've made enough progress with gender inclusion, but I do know that basketball stands, the fundamental principle of gender inclusion, no other sport that close to its inception said, yeah, everybody plays, everybody can be included. It must be a principle going forward. If you have a policy, a plan, an a, 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 a organization, and you do not have gender Total gender inclusion fundamentally at the beginning, it will fail. 
it will fail. These are our sisters, our mothers, our aunts, our, they are us. Inclusion was really important to James Naismith. So much so that if positionless was one rule he said you can never change, the other rule was this game must be easy to access. It must be easy to play. You could you put it anywhere. It can be in cities, it can be in farms, it can be in dirt, it can be in wood, it can be. I want this to be easy to play. Access was a big deal for James Naismith. In his world, it was the greatest wealth inequality to that time in the history of the United States. The world was premised on access. Who had it? Very little. And who didn't? Most people. This was a response. Access is a very important principle, isn't it? Everybody likes to talk about systemic, systemic inequality, systemic discrimination. The thesis of basketball was systemic access. You see it no greater. You see it in action in no greater form than on the playground. You ever go play playground basketball? Go to the playground to play basketball, and here's what happens. Nobody checks your ID. Nobody checks your passport. Nobody checks your credit. Nobody checks your citizenship. There's no commissioner, no gatekeeper. The only rules in that space, law students, are the rules assented to by those who are present. I don't know another space like this in the world. It is the last best free communal space there is. And it has been because of that. Well, in the United States, it's one of the most important spaces to express self-determination for the African-American community. Clothes, music, community. But in other countries, in other places, this space has made people who are not from that place feel welcome. I'm talking about immigration. I'm talking about immigration. When James Naismith invented basketball, it was the greatest wealth inequality of all time. And it was also a time of unprecedented immigration. He wanted this game to be a place where people who weren't able to access the fields and the private clubs, even the YMCA was like, yeah, man, no, 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 but not you. He wanted this game to be that kind of space. And it was successfully integrated Eastern European and Southern European Americans at that time. Now, that was 130 years ago. You're like, hey, really? Can basketball be a serious immigration policy? Go to Canada. Go to Canada, the country that takes pound for pound more immigrants than any other country in the world. Per capita, more immigrants than any other country in the world. As part of an intentional, federal, multicultural policy, that was instituted in the 1970s by the father of the current prime minister. And over time, well, you've seen these immigrants come from Africa, the West Indies, South Asia, East Asia, Eastern Europe. Where do they go? Where do people with very little go? in order to participate. It's not ice, it's not hockey, it's not the pads and the skates, it's strange. They go to basketball courts. And when you saw the Toronto Raptors win the, the, the NBA championship and it was like a, a moment of national unity and, and, and jubilation, like if they won the World Cup or somebody won the Olympics or something like that, you saw a basketball team that was two and a half, that, that celebration was two and a half generations of basketball knitting together a multicultural society led 
by the general manager who's Nigerian born, British raised, Masai Uchiri, fronted by a hip hop star, Drake, whose father was uh, 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 African American Catholic, his mother was white, Canadian Jewish, emblemized by an Indian Canadian turban wearing Sikh, who is the only fan inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. When you give access, you create a space for belonging, a space that lets people know, I'm okay here, I can connect with you here. Could this work in, like in Canada, could it work in Malmo or Marseille or, or Phoenix, Arizona? I know it works in Toronto. These are big global issues. I'll tell you two more acute issues, two 21st century issues, urban and rural. You know what I mean? The country and the city, they don't agree on anything in any country. They don't watch the same television shows. They don't laugh at the same jokes. They don't vote for the same political candidates. But I know one thing that is equally beloved in Indiana, in Iowa, in Kentucky, as it is in Harlem, Compton. It's this thing. And if there is one thing, that means there is a thing. And if there is a thing, that means there can be another thing. And we can begin to build a common language between the city and the country, between urban and rural, the other really acute, I mean, very specific 21st century issue is loneliness. They, 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 they say it's an epidemic. They say it's never been this bad, even though we have more ways to connect. Where are the spaces we can go to connect? Where are the places that people go to see each other? I mean, we, 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 we order our movies at home, we order our groceries delivered, we order our education and our work is remote. Where do we come together? Where do we meet each other? Of course, the answer I wanna tell you is a basketball court, but I wanna tell you the reason I know is because it was a global experiment. When COVID happened, they said, here's the only thing we know, stay away from each other. If you want to live, stay away from each other. Social isolation. And man, wouldn't you know that people all over the world would still play basketball? The mayors, the governors, the governments were like, stop playing basketball. You have to stop. They put out public service announcements. People wouldn't stop playing basketball. They weren't saying this about tennis. They weren't saying this about bocce. They weren't saying this about anything else. People would not stop playing so much that they had to go take down the rooms. Wow. And I told this, do, do you know the, the, the book, The Body Keeps the Score? The Body Keeps the Score. It's uh, uh, written by a doctor named Bessel van der Kolk. It's like, like bestseller for 500 weeks straight. Um, he understands trauma. He, un he has redefined our understanding of trauma and how to, to, to treat post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And he doesn't get out of bed for less than $50,000. I said, I called him up. I said, hey, man, you know, and he's like, yo, I don't get out of bed for less than, I was like, I know, I know. He's, I said, but I read your book. And you said there are four things that treat trauma. Four things. It's a group rhythmic activities. Group sing. You know how they start little kids in school with a group sing? You know why they do that? Because it works. Group sing, group dance, drum circle, and it's basketball. And I'm like, I, you know, I have to. And he's like, I will come to your class. And he explained how this kind of thing, the cooperation, 
small space. Yeah, thinking about you, thinking about me, I'm thinking about them, I'm thinking, I'm now a part of something. Changes, post-traumatic stress disorder, where people are walking around the world in searing isolation, they, they, the trauma happened in the past, but every day it feels like it's happening now, and they don't know how to connect. He said basketball is one of those things. Because look, these spaces are getting harder and harder to find. I call it sanctuary. Lots of people do. But we're living in a world where I can't go anywhere without this. And you can find me. You can track me. You can algorithmatize me. You can uh, analyze me in a hundred different ways for a hundred different purposes. Where do I go? But that's not happening. Where do I go where only my experience is my own? Many people have, they, people have, they're getting trained in mindfulness, right? To be present. It's important because that's where the new ideas come from. The basketball court has served as that for so many people for so long. That's why I go. A lot of people I know go. It stands for the principle that we need these spaces. We need to start creating more spaces where you can be who you are, hear yourself, and begin to advance instead of being told what you said yesterday and asked to buy what you might buy because of what you said yesterday. I'll say one last thing. Am I doing good on time? It's okay. Um, I'll say one last thing. It's the last principle, transcendence. Whoa. Transcendence, right? Basketball is the only sport with an elevated goal. Think about it. No other sport has a goal in view. That means it asks you to ascend. This sport asks you to leave the ground, to fly. Well, that's impossible, right? We know we can't fly. We know we cannot defy gravity. But basketball says, do it anyway. That's what we do in this thing. We go up. So many problems in the world today, in the news, they just call it intractable, which means impossible. We don't know what to do about this. It's been going on forever. I say, yeah, that's the whole idea. That's what basketball stands for. What they say is impossible, that's where we need to go and make it possible. What they say is unimaginable, that's exactly what we need to imagine and make it happen. No great society has ever only solved the problems that are on the ground and in front of its face. We must fly. Or we must dare to dream to fly. That dream is a basketball dream. Hey, look, ask yourself, who's been running the show? Who's been running the show for a thousand years, for the last a thousand years? Let's just take that, okay? Who's been running the show? It's the same kinds of leaders. Who am I talking about? Monarchs? Religious types, military types, lawyers, politicians, economists. And these leaders, same kinds of leaders for a thousand years, have come up with ideas, systems to uh, make our world more efficient, more fair, uh, more productive. I'm talking about isms. You know these isms, right? Capitalism, socialism, communism, deism, theism, utilitarianism. And all I'm asking, Okay, is with a thousand years 
of the same kinds of leaders coming up with the same kinds of ideas, where are we? Really, are we still talking about gender? Are we still talking about race? Are we still talking about inclusion? Are we still talking about hunger? Next slide. Let's just say I told you this wasn't about basketball. We're not talking about basketball. I'm here to give you 13 ideas for the 21st century. Here, this is, oh, wait, what? Go back. Five. Doesn't have the picture of the basketball player. The basketball player with that same form. Perfect jump shot. Um, but look, it's not about basketball. <laughs> Let's say this was a political candidate. This was the platform. Let's say this was a, a non-governmental organization. And this was their mission statement. Let's say this was a, 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 a corporation. And this is their HR manual for 2024. Would you like it? Would you vote for it? All I'm saying. Can basketball save the world? <laughs> I don't know. But what I'm saying is <laughs> it is about basketball. It is, it does come from basketball. And for me, this, this is my Ten Commandments. This is my Magna Carta. This is my Bhagavad Gita. To me, this is how basketball can save the world. Thank you very much for listening to me. We are going to, yeah, I'll let, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Okay, we have um, an hour for a Q&A session and uh, I'd like, to, would you like to, to begin with uh, with the players, or uh, would, would you have anything to to talk about, or just leave the the floor to the audience? We can we can see if uh, if there is someone who is going to ask a question. We have actual basketball players here. Um, actually, even though it may, yeah, we have actual basketballs, and we can sit here uh, and encourage. Uh, that's it. Okay, Matteo, tomorrow, tomorrow. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, I'll sit down too and uh, ask us anything. Ask us, so you can sit, coach. He's used to being in charge. Look at me. So, yeah. Sit, and, and uh, you can ask us any questions. And probably, sure. Yeah, yeah. So we will begin here. Question? How did you come up with these 13 principles? Was it a um, night long enlightenment or a lifelong enlightenment? That's a very good can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I've probably been thinking about it all my life, but there were two uh, points where I thought about it more seriously. One was uh, like 15 years ago, I read a book called How Soccer Explains the World. Um, it was around the World Cup and it was a journalist and uh, he was trying to explain a new concept called globalization, showing how different countries play soccer differently. I like that book. I thought it was clever, but I thought to myself at that time, 15, 16, whatever it is, years ago, that basketball could actually do more. And then, like I say, uh, five years ago, um, I uh, saw that the world was changing in a way that was difficult for me and my students. 
And so I wanted to speak to everyone in a language that I thought no one was speaking. Um, and uh, it took me a, a week to really settle on those principles. I, I wish it was less. I wish it was 10. It'd be easier. Um, but I thought that that was the right, these were all the right ones. And I couldn't think of any more and I couldn't eliminate any. Yes. Yes, teacher. Um, thank you, first of all. And I have a question about your course and why you. So how basketball can save the world. If you can give us an insight on your course and why do you think students choose your course uh, and between all the others that are available and why do you think it's so popular? It's definitely not because of the professor. Um, uh, I think, uh, well, th there's three reasons why um, students take my course. Um, one is because, um, oh, they like basketball. Um, two is because uh, they say, oh, basketball can save the world? Prove it. They want to see, for real, is this true? They want to challenge. The third group is because they want to save the world. They really want to know some new ideas about saving the world. So it's once a week, two and a half hours. Um, and uh, uh, I usually, uh, I'm more of an interactive uh, professor, but I take the first part of it and lecture. We talk about the principles. And the second part, I usually have a guest. And I will have artists, politicians, urban planners, um, uh, filmmakers, authors. Uh, and yes, of course, we've had some of the most famous basketball players. Uh, uh, so that, that's, that's how the course goes. Okay, so my question is, do you think the, how can I say, the American mentality uh, gets along, follows in some ways the, the principles you assert? No. Um, uh, I think there is, these are aspirational. Um, I know that when people get on a basketball court, they do. Um, or they try, or they should. Uh, but I'm not sure who is, I mean, there are lots of people who are doing wonderful things in the world. Um, a whole a whole country is, uh, the Amer I don't even know what the American mentality is right now. It's split. Um, uh, that is what the mentality is. Um, what I'm trying to do is, um, you know, when I have these discussions and I say the word capitalism, a lot of people stop listening because they think that word is bad. And then I say the word socialism. A lot of people stop listening because they think that word is bad. So I say, <laughs> about to say a bad word, but I say, forget it. How about a new language? Okay because all I want to do is solve problems. So I find that there is a strange mentality these days where nobody can hear each other, where nobody can agree on facts or history or much of anything. And I'm trying to find a little space where everybody can maybe for a short time Get there. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you and first for coming and I have a question. So how can bas how can basketball save the world? But basically also in basketball as in every other sports, there's someone winning and someone losing. And basketball players here can say, like every sportsman, you you hate losing. So who wins in this game? Who wins the world, society? Does someone win, or is it just about the game? Yes, I'm. I'm gonna. I, I want the basketball players to answer because some some people feel like they were born to win. Um, that's a little joke from my friends. Uh, um, but 
when I talk about, so these are professional basketball players. Um, they, they are, you know, they, they're paid to win. Um, but um, you may have heard uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo talk to a reporter um, at, the, at a press conference last, last year. His team is supposed to win the championship. And they asked him, they said, uh, and he didn't win. They lost in the playoffs. And he said, do you consider this a failure? And I won't repeat everything he said, but you should go watch the YouTube because it's not about that. Um, this is a metaphor. Who are we playing against? Life. We're playing against the challenges of being on earth. We, we're, we're playing against the, the, the struggle of being born and all of a sudden realizing you're not alone and there's a planet and there's just so much space and all of us have to figure out how to share it and what to do with it. And all I know is that the things we do on, a, and these guys are real experts at it. They're like high level. These guys are artists, they're practitioners. You know, he's a, a great teacher of it. It's a discipline. It's a way of thinking about yourself with other selves. That's what, it's not, a, it's the win is doing that well. You guys can talk about it better than I can. <laughs> okay. Well, I hate losing. So, um, you know, I, it's, uh, sometimes coaches will say, I had a coach in college say, you never lose, you just learn. Um, so maybe that's something that uh, we can take away from from how this relates to life. But, um, you know, when in basketball, you're, you're competing, you're trying to win. Uh, when you lose, you watch film, you learn from your mistakes and you study it. Uh, when you win, feels great. You have a lot of confidence, everybody, celebrates you and loves you um but when you lose you have to learn and you have to try to get better and improve upon your mistakes so i don't know i'm i don't know if that's a good answer and i'll let bc go ahead <clears throat> uh for me um uh it goes towards what you're saying about balance uh you can't really enjoy or know what a win feels like without losing if you won all your life if you win everything in life, um, that loss doesn't feel the same. But if you go through a mixture of wins and losses, you can appreciate the wins and know that the losses are not a final and that the win is not a, a end destination either. It's a constant cycle of winning and losing in life. I'm a coach and a great coach in the past said, uh, I don't love to win. I just hate to lose. And I mean, it's right. I, in my life, I win sometimes, lost sometimes. For sure, I lost too many hours of good sleep. Uh, that's, uh, that's part of our life because uh, I have to try to teach them, to prepare them, to, to have all the weapons to win the game. But after that, we play, we face opponents. I have to handle with uh, with human beings, with their uh, with their personality, with their problems, with their ups and downs. Uh, uh, that's that's the beautiful part of my job because uh, at the end of the season, uh, I in in Europe we used to change uh, more or less or the roster or keep two, three, four players. We used to meet uh, every season. 10 different men with their history on their back, with their dreams on their mind. For me, that's the most beautiful thing of my job because I, for me, it's not a job. Uh, I say to them uh, when we spoke the first time and they con I think they can confirm, what I want for them is the best, to enjoy the time with, uh, with me, with, uh, with my club, uh, with my team. 
try to have a better contract next year or decide to stay if we had the same common the common idea to to keep going and when we when they will go on their uh, Instagram account in 20 years and watch the picture of this season, say, okay, maybe coach was not a genius. Maybe was not uh, the best coach yet, but was a great person and we had uh, fun times all together. That's something who lead me every single day uh, because that's it's what I learned on my, on my skin in the past. That's uh, I, I remember, and my best friends arrived from basketball. My the best of mine now we live in Berlin, uh, and we, pl we play together just on a playground, three on three basketball. Okay, and uh, I used to go. I'm less than one meter and eighty and play post. Okay, it was uh, <laughs> five centimeters taller than me, and we used to guard the big man because we stuff as hell. And we have a two meter and three who shoot just three pointers. Okay, and he never entered the paint. And we say to him, "Come on, man." Help me, and but that's it. That's our life, and uh, I'm glad to to know every day, every season, people from all over the world, and now I'm I'm here, and uh, and that's it. Great question. I want to say that your English is amazing, guys. Sorry for mine. I was a, I was a very needed when I was young because I never studied English. I started to study by myself when I was 30, and, uh, and, and that's it. Thank you, everybody, for speaking English. So I wanted to ask to the basketball players mostly if they think about basketball as a philosophy as you do. Because for me, I love the 13 principles it's a very nice thing because i think it's a good philosophy don't know if it can save the world but uh, i'd like to know if it's a thing that basketball players see really basketball as 13 principles a philosophy of life and how we can if it's really the whole life they go through life with the principles of basketball or they just play and then go on with their life I don't know, just wanted to ask. Yeah, so for me, I, uh, first of all, I love the presentation. I had never, I've never thought about basketball in this way. And I'm embarrassed that I haven't read the book yet. But I definitely, after seeing the cover, I've seen it, uh, social media. And, but for me, I grew up suburb of Chicago. So I'm from Ch Chicago suburb, maybe 45 minutes mostly white people where I'm from, white and Hispanic. Um, and growing up, I thought I was the best player in the world because I was playing against people in my neighborhood, in my community. And uh, when I started going into the city, into Chicago, into the urban areas, I realized there's a lot better basketball players. Guys that look a little bit more like DC here. Um, but what, what basketball did is it brought me together with people that, you know, I, I was raised in a different environment, so I don't remember what point that was, maybe 10 or nine or 10, uh, David, but it brought me together with people that, you know, I didn't grow up around. I grew up, you know, my, I had two parents in the home and we had food on the table every night, uh. So that point really hit home with me. Um, the inclusion and loneliness, uh, or it was not inclusion, but I mean, inclusion was part of what I just said, but um, the, the loneliness piece, like basketball was always my escape. So whenever I was alone or sad about something, go outside, play basketball. Uh, the last point, transcendence. Like, I feel like basketball is a sport that there's no limit to how good you can be. Um, I do a lot of camps in the summer and I always tell the kids, basketball to me is a sport where there's so much creativity. There's so many things you can do with dribbling, with passing, different shots you can take, different moves, um, defensively to do different things and get steals and steal the ball. Uh, you see, if you look at basketball players, 
there's so many different styles of play, and that's what I also love about it. Uh, so, yeah, th those are a couple of things. I mean, I always think that Jesus can save the world and saves the world, but I, I think that David has a pretty good point here that basketball has a lot of those same same principles. <clears throat> Um, I won't say too much, but um, towards the statement of how can basketball save the world, I can just more so speak about my life and basketball has saved my life in a sense that before I was 18, uh, basketball wasn't even a thought. <laughs> it wasn't a concern of mine. I never even thought about basketball. But within a one year of working with a certain mentor that helped discover me and helped put me into this world of basketball. I'm now sitting in Trento, Italy, uh, with people I would have never seen before, places I would have never gone before without the sport of basketball. And if it can do that for me at 18, I can only imagine if those principles and connections and community can do to an entire world. Can I, can I just, uh, you know, of course, uh, no one has been thinking about when they play basketball, these 13 principles before. This is a new idea. Uh, and I wanna tell you how new I think it is. Um, basketball was not meant simply or only to be uh, an institution for elite athletic development or for commercialized purposes, which is pretty much where most sports sit right now in the world. You think of sports and you think of, I'm going to be the best at it or I, I, we're going to make a lot of money with this. Nike, see, all these kinds of things, right? But I wanna say, and you know this, you can get a degree in music, in art, in dance, in drama, right? And I think those are legitimate degrees. They teach you all kinds of things about the world and history and, and, and the human condition. And part of getting those degrees is the doing of the thing. You dance and then you understand like, uh, okay, I'm interpreting an era or I'm, I'm, I'm starting to communicate. You do art, you paint, and you're like, I, now I'm interpreting uh, a, a, a feeling or a, a sentiment. You act and you understand what it's like to be someone else. I don't understand how athletics is any different. I don't understand why it's always been over there. Music, art, drama, uh, dance, these are ancient cultural forms, like sports. But somehow sports has never been validated academically. No one has said, when you play this game, this is actually what's happening. This is actually what you're learning. I believe that the best of sport, basketball especially, but the best of sport is yet to come. That it is much bigger than the world even understands it as currently. That it will do more as a social institution, as an educational institution, as a developmental institution, as it will as a commercial or athletic enterprise. When I meet someone like Andrea Nardelli, he's got a vision much bigger um, sure, he's got things to do and objectives to meet, but he's got a vision for this game as standing for more in a community than just let's get faster and make more baskets. It's a social institution. It was always meant to be that way. Yes. Because I think of uh, many friends that play basketball in like the B2 leagues here in Italy and stuff like that at uh, like junior levels and they lost that idea. So I think that I'm sorry because I was a ballerina, so I don't get basketball and I get dance as a, as a degree and I'm like thinking. And you're in law school. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm thinking about the. Uh, these principles starting to like they have to go first uh, to really the sport like the players even if they have six years like they have they are six year olds that a lot of coaches don't even think about those principles so yeah. and i think it it's more important to talk to them than to us 
I really like the idea of the 13 principles over basketball, but I think that also the word basketball day at the UN, it's more like a, I don't know, a thing to, seems a bit, I don't want to be offensive American. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it seems like yeah, you want to be validated uh, as a sport and it's uh, awesome and all that stuff. But I think that it has to go firstly through the playgrounds and all stuff like that because I I played basketball with my friends. Equality and uh, balance and all that stuff, it's way out of their mind. Yeah. So I think it has to start like also in the playgrounds and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think it should start with... Uh... First grade, um, for example, uh, in many schools, when a kid is five years old, Johnny, let's say his name is, and Johnny gets in trouble, and the teacher says to Johnny, Johnny, if you keep doing this, no recess. Do, do you have recess, the, the, the word recess? Yeah, rec no recess, right? They never say, Johnny, if you keep doing this, no math. No math today. And at six years old, seven years old, eight years old, I believe developmentally, play is as important or more important for Johnny. We don't understand what this thing is anymore. And it starts somewhere, right? So World Basketball Day, eh, it's a pretty big megaphone. Um, you know, I mean, I'll try harder. Um, but, you know, United Nations, you know, they, they have a big stage in the world. A lot of people know who they are. Um, but you have to start somewhere. And we're just beginning. I'm in Trento. We have time for two more questions. Yeah. So, Hi. Uh, while listening to your presentation, I had like the feeling that the majority of those principles could be applied uh, to a variety of sports. So my question was, on which principles you feel the major differentiation on basketball rather than, I don't know, I'm thinking football because of my background here in Italy. I know it's the most followed sport in the world. So yeah, why do you feel basketball has this special feature? There's a few differences. Um, uh, by the way, I think all sports are great. Uh, I think all sports teach us wonderful things. Um, basketball, uh, well, there is no other sport that is totally positionless. Even football, soccer, um, uh, and hockey, which approximate the movement of basketball in its fullest elongation, the Defensive players don't spend that much time in the offensive area. And the goalie has very different powers than everyone else. Um, so positionlessness is different. Um, the small space and intimacy of the game in its fullest elongation. Now, in the favelas in Brazil, people play little, you know, street, the street versions of every single game. But basketball was intentionally meant to be small, intimate different kind of communication, play in your underwear. Um, the other one is, uh, and I won't say it's, uh, it makes it different, but when I say it's global, right? You say, wow, well, come on, there's other sports that more people play, right? Let's look at them. More people play cricket than play basketball, they do. But cricket is not everywhere. It isn't. Now, more people play soccer than play basketball. Soccer is the most popular sport in the world. But soccer does not have the influence of basketball. The sneakers, the fashion, the music. Um, in fact, there's a great soccer team in uh, Paris called uh, Paris Saint-Germain. You know them? Yeah, uh, and to be more relevant, to be cooler, they made a deal with Jordan Company. You know what I'm talking about? They have the basketball player on their jersey. I don't think you would ever see a soccer player 
on a basketball jersey. Why? It stands for something, an ethos, a feeling, a dream, a different kind of, 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 of way of, of walking through the world. It has more influence. Ubiquity and influence make basketball a global force unlike any other. Oh, sorry. Yes, makes sense. What, what? Tell me the soccer music you are listening to. <laughs> no, but I feel like, like to know. the Jordan thing on the PSG shirt is more because of the legend of Michael Jordan right. rather than the... Who's Michael Jordan? Yeah, a basketball player, but he's... He's known for other things rather than playing basketball. What? No, I mean yeah. underwear. No, no, he got he got famous for that, but he got very famous for that. Yeah, but he but became, only he became something more than just basketball. Like what? An icon. Because. A uh, good marketing also. Yeah, because of the brand, because of the. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I understand your point, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure that. It's only basketball to have that kind of power. I would like to hear the alternatives. Yeah, soccer. I'm always I'm I, I'm more I'm more a basketball fan rather than a soccer fan. But mm. do you if I want to be objective, I'd say that soccer is more influential rather than that. Yeah, also base basketball is not that peaceful. Yeah, well, can I answer? Okay. Look at it. Yeah. I'm from Italy like you. <laughs> okay, because in Italy it's different. Okay, we used to go outside and play soccer, but the big difference is with our feet, we are not so precise, we are not so good like in basketball. Because in basketball, you use your hands, it's something create really connection. When uh, he spoke before with his uh, with his move, with the the eye connection, you don't have eye connection when you play soccer. Because you watch the ball. When we played basketball, you used to watch in the eyes of your teammates. You used to watch uh, the maybe the move they had before to go to one side to another one. Okay, it's something is something different. Okay, I think this book is amazing. For sure, the one to convince you is the basketball. Okay, but it's to open our mind and. Okay, but basketball is a is an instrument to go. Okay, is a is a weapon to enter into your our mind. Also, my mind. Okay, that's it's not just basketball. It is more than basketball. And you, it's a symbol. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so glad he's here. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. No. So thank you, Aquila Basket, and thank you, David Lander. This is only the beginning of our journey together. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.